we'll start. Might reach that number soon, actually, <laughs> which is great. Awesome. Uh, hi, Sharshal, how Monica, Ina, Susanna. One more person to meet our 50. <laughs> Sahil, hi Sahil, hi Mike, hi Kelly. Okay, I think I'm not hearing any dings anymore. Hi Dr. Romero, thanks for coming. Um, so I think I'm gonna get started. Um, so I'm gonna start by introducing our uh, featured, um, not quite speaker, but she's there to offer her life experience um, and I decided to invite her because first of all she's a, a PAMSA alumni and we love our alumni dearly and is has a lot of expertise um, she's an associate professor of clinical pediatrics at, at Keck School of Medicine at USC and she's also the chief medical director of quality and clinical effectiveness hospital of Los Angeles and I, and so our goal today, of course, as advertised is, whoop, sorry, we'll start with here. So our goal today is to have a brief overview of the histories and current realities of the challenges Asian physicians and medical trainees face in America. And I felt that I can't quite capture that without having uh, someone who is more seasoned and um, so Dr. Wu is there to offer her um, kind of lived knowledge later on in the discussion part of uh, seminar today. So before we officially start, I wanted to start with uh, land acknowledgement. And so I am a student, a medical student at Vanderbilt, and we acknowledge that um, we are on the land that used to belong to the Cherokee and Shawnee people. They were um, forced to move to Oklahoma currently. And the university resides on land that was ceded in 1795. And we wanted to recognize, support, and advocate for the indigenous individuals and communities who live um, here now. So now I'll start with just an outline of what to expect in our seminar today. So I'll begin with a history of the plague and COVID and the parallels between the two, and hopefully give some overview of the history of Asian discrimination in the US. And then I'll talk about the dichotomy of the model minority myth and the yellow peril. And we'll summarize and have some discussion questions afterwards. All right, so I wanted to set, start my the history with the beginning of Asian immigrants in the US. So it starts in the late 19th centuries in San Francisco. And this is when we have Chinese immigrants coming to the US for the California gold rush, but also for the railroad constructions. And by 1851, about 25,000 immigrants came and by 1888, 16% of San Francisco residents were Chinese. And I put this picture here because it shows the, the image of Chinese immigrants in the US in those times. And on the left here, you have our, the caricature or depiction of Chinese immigrants. We can see that they're like eating rats, they're living all crowded in this quarters. And in the contrast, we have this like family man, you know, who has all children, they have this house with like cutlery and stuff. And this image is basically saying why it's almost like a dehumanization of the Chinese immigrants. And the this is where the word yellow peril comes in because they're saying that by having Chinese immigrants who are paid less, they are basically taking over the jobs that are available for 
our our white Americans who are you know who have morals and have like a family to support. So because of that Chinese um, anti-Chinese sentiments, we have the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882, and so this banned Chinese from attaining citizenship, and that means that there's no right to vote, to own land, and have a family. And by have a family, I say that because in later laws, they prevented, there are other laws to prevent Chinese women from entering the country by citing that there were courtesans. And so Chinese men were, it, it was hard for them to start a family in the United States. So on the right here, we have, we start with the stereotype of yellow peril. And all these words that are associated with the Chinese immigrants were, again, that they're subhuman, they're stealing jobs, that they're foreign, they're undesirable, and they're filthy and diseased. And so there was a negative feedback loop of disease and the stereotype of yellow peril. And so, I, as you can imagine, there's a lot of immigrants, not just Chinese immigrants, who are coming to San Francisco for the gold rush and for the railroad railroad jobs. And so many ethnic and faith-based hospitals opened up in San Francisco, but the Chinese patients were actually shunned. And so for example, in 1875, only 68 of 4,000 patients admitted to the city and county hospital were actual Chinese natives. And the reason that those patients were turned away was basically racism. <laughs> they thought that they would suffer from loathsome ailments that would contaminate the other civilized patients. So as you can imagine, because they didn't have good access to healthcare and they lived in this overcrowded, um, poor overcrowded in uh, neighborhoods that lacked in sanitation, there were exploding cases of smallpox and leprosy and syphilis. And this was a time when germ theory was not established yet. And so the prevailing theory was that the disease, it's spread by bad air. And so you, as you can see from this image on the right, Chinatown was basically suspected of breeding disease and spreading it to the rest of San Francisco. So that's when there are countless inspections and harassment and punitive measures against Chinese immigrants um, during this time. There is another kind of cultural misunderstanding that fed into the image of Chinese as inhuman. And I think a major representation of that is the chambers of tranquility. And so within Chinese culture, there was, uh, you, did, you, were, you, were, you left the dying patients with people who are dead because you did not want to spread like the killing airs from the dying patients. And also once they're dead, um, you want the soul to stay close to the body to ensure that there will be a proper funeral and a burial, like you can send the body over to mainland China for them to be buried with their loved ones. But the Western, Westerners who were unfamiliar with Chinese culture were outraged by, and saying that this was an inhuman abandonment of the sick and dying in death chambers, as you can see in, the, in this news article in 1896. And so this exacerbated the stereotype of the Chinese as a subhuman race. But the, the flip side of that is Chinese immigrant patients would prefer these chambers of tranquility over city and county hospitals that were far away because first of all, traveling meant that they had to risk harassment and violence because it meant that you had to go outside of Chinatown. They are charged higher taxes and fees if they even found a hospital that would admit them. And of course, there was a language barrier. And there was also the distrust of Western medical practices because again, there was uncertainty on what would happen if they should die in the hospital. And so this is when the Tonghua dispensary opened. And so the fundraising effort was led by General Consul Ho Yao. And basically it was a group of Chinese, he kind of sort, uh, crowdsourced his funds from like expense, uh, Chinese merchants. And the staff was a mix of Chinese and Western practitioners, um, but it was headed by 
a white person to comply with California law. And, but there's still differences between being seen by a Western practitioner versus not because they cost more than Chinese doctors. The other thing is this dispensary was volunteer based and there's a lot of turnover of attendings and others joined with varying motives. For example, they may have an interest to disease that's endemic to Asia, or they just want to improve clinical skills. And I think this is kind of reminiscence in a lot of like the free students led clinics that we see in a lot of the, in our medical schools. So you can see that in history as well. So then comes our plague and our, the plague, the first victim of the plague happened in March, 1900. And so, the discovery of the source of the plague was actually discovered a bit before then. It was circulating in Asia. There was little known about transmission, treatment, or prevention of Yersinia pestis. And the Surgeon General at the time thought that it was a disease of the Orient and that it won't, uh, that Europeans will be impervious to it. So even the disease was racialized. And so, once the, there was one victim, Chinatown went to total lockdown. No one was going out, no one's going in. And that also included the Western practitioners of Tongwa dispensary. So patients, they, they couldn't see any patients in Chinatown. And with this lockdown, and in, as you can imagine, there were inspections as well. There was distrust against Westerners that increase and the Chinese population in Chinatown began to hide dead and dying from the dead and dying from the health inspectors because the victims were threatened with dis dismemberment for autopsy. And obviously that would not, um, I mean, the, the dismemberment would prevent a proper burial. And so in a week, death certificates issued by Western physicians in Chinatown were deemed to be unreliable and they were denied burial permits, which again, it uh, culturally meant a lot for Chinese immigrants. And that's again, increased the cycle of hiding the dead and preventing people from knowing of the plague. So during this time, there were a couple of doctors who knew about this plague and wanted to, they isolated the disease and wanted to prevent it, but there were politic, political interests um, that got in the way. And so the medical practice at the time was to see patients and not, it didn't incorporate microbiology and the spread of the plague was met with denial. So Dr. So Joseph Kenyon was the one who isolated the samples and confirmed the plague, but city health officials just didn't want anything to do with it. So the California mayor at the time, he basically had plague called people plague fakers, um, for casting a fearful shadow in California. And he thought, he accused Dr. Kinyun that he's the one spreading the disease by collecting these samples. But the plague was there. And by the summer, um, 20, 21 states um, neighboring California elected to ban all traffic from California, which included trains. And so then it, was, it had an economic impact um, and that's when the state officials decided to clean up Chinatown. And so the official death toll is 119, but you can imagine that they, the actual death toll will be much bigger than that as people either died unreported or their family members would hide their, hide their death. And I wanted to point out that this is a stark contrast to when the plague resurged in 1907 um, and in that time, cases arose among some white residents in Oakland and San Francisco, and immediate action was taken, and about $2 million at that time, money at that time, was spent to trap and kill rats. And you might have noticed that there's some very similar motifs that arise as what we've experienced in COVID. And it really showed that 120 years later, the yellow peril still persists. So I broke it down in this chart, the 
kind of the parallels between these two. So in the plague in 1850s to 1900s, again, the stereotype was that Asian immigrants carry disease because they're not civilized. And in COVID-19, we still have this stereotype that Asian Americans, whether they're immigrants or not, if they look Asian, they're a perpetual immigrant and they're an outsider. The misunderstanding that exacerbated this bias in that time was chambers of tranquility. But in our case, it's that the COVID started in Wuhan and that it started in the bush market and everything else is really to politicize. But I think the fact is true that it began in Wuhan and then everything, um, all the stereotypes began from there. And it also reverberated into the effect on Asian patients. And 120 years ago and today, I think it remains similar in that there's lack of access to healthcare in, in big portions of our community. Um, and a lot of it is issues due to cost, a language barrier, and mistrust towards um, physicians. And this results in poor health outcomes amongst our Asian populations. And in terms of effects on physician, even then there's a tearing of Western and Chinese physicians. And even our Asian American physicians today, there's othering and also the distrust from our own patients who have, you know, who come with stereotypes against us. And I know that I set the stage to, to look at the uh, introduction of Chinese immigrants to the United States, but I only did that because I think the themes carry out and it's, it's pretty similar to all the Asian groups who have immigrated to the US and the discrimination against Asian groups is, is intrinsic to the history of the United States. So on the right here, I have this pie chart of um, uh, Asian Americans broken down by origin groups. And, um, and let's start with our two um, origin groups, which have the longest history, which are the Chinese and Japanese. So I already talked about the Chinese Exclusion Act and, and I want to note that it didn't get repealed until, until 1943. And there's also the Immigration Act of 1917 and Immigration Act of 1924 that basically banned um, other Asian immigrants by setting a zone and also putting on a quota system. And so this is a prevention of influx of new immigrants. So what about the immigrants who already came here? So there were two famous cases listed here, which basically prevented existing immigrants to become US citizens on the basis of non-whiteness. And both of these people, so Zawa was like a very successful businessman. He was like Christian and had all these like very white proxy things. And uh, Bhagat Singh Thin, he, he fought in the war and in the first World War I and both of them were denied citizenship because they're not considered white. And of course, for our Japanese immigrants, um, there's all, we can't forget about the Japanese internment that started in 1941. How about our other big groups in the United States? So for our Filipino population, uh, it has a long rooted colonial history. So it was under Spanish occupation until 1898, until it was ceded to the US. And then there was a period of the Commonwealth era. And I think it was ironic that during that time, they were still paying tariffs by becoming a Commonwealth. It, now Filipinos were restricted from entry to the US. And then of course there are major wars, um, the Korean War and the Vietnam War. And after that, we had a, a large um, group of refugees who also came to the United States. But I think what's most notable is the Immigration Act of 1965. And it's notable because it is the inception of the model minority myth. So what that Immigration Act did is that it prioritized um, 
family reunification, but also students and skilled workers, especially in the STEM fields. And this graph kind of shows that starting from that act, we have a huge influx of other AAPIs. And in particular, this is where a, a large portion of the Indian American population came in to the United States. What's also notable for the model minority myth um, is that this is, again, it was around 1965, right? And so it was at the end of the Cold War and the beginning of the civil rights movement. And the idea that the model minority, so these are hardworking um, individuals pull up by their bootstraps and succeed academically. This was used as a weapon to argue against slavery, that two plus centuries of black enslavement could be overcome by hard work and strong family values, just as these you know, Chinese Americans uh, or other um, Asian immigrants at this time that were highly skilled and highly educated came to the United States. So now at this point, we have this dichotomy of the model minority myth and the yellow peril. And the model minority myth might be thought of as a positive thing because it assumes that we'll be you know, successful, that we are smart. But, what's the, but we have to understand that it also overlooks the inequalities between the different ethnic groups. Because as I stated before, the, the reasons and the history behind each ethnic groups are very different in the United States. And even amongst Chinese populations, the Chinese population who came in um, in the uh, gold rush is very different from the Chinese immigrants who came in the 1960s to study in the United States. So this begs the question, did the model minority myth replace the yellow peril? And is it for the better? Are we now free of yellow peril? And COVID has really just, taken it home for us that Asians individually may be treated as a white proxy, meaning that we can go to these fancy schools, we can get into med school, and we can be thought, oh, this is because you know we're good at math and we're good at test taking and whatnot. But bias is irrespective of race or status. And this is, and COVID has really shown us that the yellow peril is, is still alive and it applies to all of us. And even amongst our medical professionals. So we saw, you know, Asian American doctors and nurses who were medical students who were still receiving um, anti Asian uh, racialized threats. And so COVID and Atlanta really helped non Asian, but also Asian people see that Asians do face discrimination. But I think as, as the dust has settled, we can now recognize that nothing has changed about the facts about the experience of Asians living in the United States. So I want to um, kind of show some examples of what that looks like in medicine. So the first is that the Asian subgroups are underrepresented in, in medicine. And so one big part of it is Southeast Asians. So as we can see here, a huge portion, uh, so 29% to be exact, are consists of, uh, are 29% of Asians in the United States are Southeast Asians. However, they're less likely to apply to medical school than Black or African Americans or Hispanic or Latinos to medical school. So that, that is a huge uh, underrepresentation. There's also, we also know at this point that the honor system, the way that we're graded is biased. And there are two examples of this that has been published. One is AOA. And we know that the odds of the AOA memberships for white students are six times greater than black students and two times greater for Asian students. And this is still significant even for um, the top quartile step one scores. We also see that in medical student performance evaluations. 
we also see um, that there is a huge underrepresentation of department chairs of fields where Asians are not a minority. So on the right here, I have the department, the number of department chairs. These are not percentages, these are absolute numbers. Um, and I also put down for some of the notable percentage of Asians in certain residency groups. And you can see for anesthesiology, internal medicine, ENT, psychiatry, surgery, these are, we're not a minority in these specialties. And yet when you look at the number of department chairs, these are remarkably smaller. The other thing to note is that the complete dearth of native Hawaiian Pacific Islander um, department chairs. The other, and also there is a huge, uh, like a one to four ratio of women to men, even amongst um, our Asian population. So overall, I think it's clear that discrimination in medicine persists. Um, but the thing is the numbers that decide decision-making, whether it's our admissions numbers, whether it's census, uh, it does not make that obvious. I think we kind of saw that with the way that COVID data was collected. And we needed the goal here, and I think the call to action for all of us is that we need to make the data that drive decision making to represent our reality, which is that we do uh, see discrimination. I also wanted to emphasize that representation is only part of the solution. So even if all uh, the population of physicians that exists in the future correctly, say, meets the ratio of this uh, racial breakdown of the United States today, that still doesn't mean that that's the end of the road for us, because there can still be issues that relate to people of color, that relate to pipeline, that relate to just thriving of Asian Americans and the acceptance of Asian Americans as Americans, those issues will still can still exist despite representation. So in summary, Asian immigration history puts all Asians, so regardless of your, your um, group of origin, at a balancing act of yellow peril and model minority, irrespective of specific histories um, behind each of our different subgroups. And COVID has really demonstrated that model minority myth may benefit certain Asians, but it offers no shield to, to the pan-Asian xenophobia and stereotypes. And this is, rep, this is demonstrated um, in medicine particularly, as Asians are negatively affected in admissions, honors evaluations, and in leadership representation. And so my call to action um, is we need to make noise for all Asian causes, not just the ones that we may identify strongly with, because in the because discrimination doesn't care about your cultural background. What unless everybody, unless we can solve Asian issues, it will still affect you. And this includes um, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander causes. And in terms of the day to day, like how do you make that happen? in medical school and in residency and, and onwards, I think uncomfortable questions require an un, unfathomable amount of resilience as the, uh, the pressures on, on you to represent your people. Um, but this is my opinion, but I think publications really ensure the conversion of fact to truth. Because like I said, unless it's on us to collect the data we need to make the case for things to change. So this, this is the end of the didactic portion of the seminar. And so before we dive into discussions, I want to give some time for people to ask questions. If you can 
drop them in the chat. While people are thinking about that, I'll take the time to kind of talk about the ground rules for our discussion portion of this, the seminar. Um, once we start the discussion part of the meeting, we will not record it um, to facilitate sharing. And so we want to emphasize that this is a safe space, meaning that only one person speaks at a time, will listen to each other, and it's okay to change our minds in the middle of the discussion and that we can agree to disagree. Um, and you can seek to understand one another, not necessarily to agree. Obviously, check your language and you can always decide what you want to share or not share. Okay. So I'm gonna let Lena mine the chat box, but I'm gonna dive into some of the discussion questions that I wrote. Um, so let's start with the first one. So Dr. Wu, I, like I said in the beginning of the talk, I think as Asian medical students, when we think about these kind of, when we say discrimination of medical students, I feel like it can be very daunting. It can feel like an echo chamber slash, you know, whispers of there is discrimination, but no like, uh, concrete things to hold on to. So I was wondering whether you can um, share, you know, first of all, whether you felt that you were biased um, and some of the ways that you kind of process that and was able to um, kind of navigate those as you went through medical training. Yeah, that's a, a great question. And, and I, um, you know, I just I want to preface this by saying, you know, our, our, our identity isn't really based on, uh, on, uh, on, you know, any comparisons about being discriminated against or not. And I do want to make sure that we're framing this in, in the context of, of, um, of, I, and I see in the chat of white supremacy, that the root of this is that uh, is not, you know, one race against the other and who's getting discriminated against more, but more that, you know, we um, have, uh, there is this, uh, this racial hierarchy, right, in our society, uh, and the structures, which you've really outlined really well in your history that have been, you know, from the very beginning at the roots of it being in our um, immigration policies, you know, and um, related, um, related laws and policies that have really uh, gotten us to this position. Um, but uh, certainly, you know, I think oftentimes um, the, what we experience, at least in my, so in my experience as a medical student, it was a little bit more insidious, right? Um, you know, just microaggressions after microaggression. I think back when I was in medical school, you know, more than 20 years ago, that really wasn't a term that was well known and so I think there was a lot of discomfort and how do we respond to that you know what what it you know little things about uh for example uh there were several times and I, I shared this with Jay I got a grade for a rotation that I never did <laughs> because it was someone else but um and and I'm sure that that has happened, you know, in terms of um, grades and evaluations, there were comments about things in, in uh, clerkship evaluations, which I was not involved in, right? And, um, and also, uh, I also recall in a lecture of, that a, a cardiologist was giving, um, uh, make, make that uh, he was uh, making comments about how the heart wasn't pumping because no tiki no washi and making fake Asian accents and nobody in the entire you know 160 <laughs> student class said anything and I looked around here and here and didn't know how to respond and you know I really am grateful for a lot of the work that um, others have done in this area and I know Asian Americans Advancing Justice and other groups have put up together a lot of resources but we really need to start to um, to interrupt, you know, these types of things, interrupt these microaggressions and call them out. And it, and it can be uncomfortable, especially when you're a student, when you're a resident, um, and you are, um, 
you know, it, and it, it come, is coming from someone who has power over you in terms of grades, uh, evaluations, and things like that. Um, but uh, they continue to persist because um, people are not um, being called out for, for this. And I do think, you know, as a fact now, as a faculty member, I, I think it is my responsibility as a faculty member um, to, uh, to be the one to do that for someone if they don't feel comfortable. So, you know, think about where you are at. It's okay if you're not comfortable, but find someone who's an advocate that can do that for you. Um, and, uh, you, you know, I, I think otherwise this won't, um, these will persist. And, and what you do here is sort of the tip of the iceberg, right? That's, that's just a sign of the underlying implicit and explicit biases that people have um, against, uh, against Asian and Pacific Islander students. And um, uh, if, if you know that that is happening, you know, I think it's also important for us to call out what else is happening that we're not aware of, right? That's not apparent. Um, how do we change the um, power dynamics and structures so that uh, we are not um, being, um, you know, this is not being perpetuated? Because we see it's not, it doesn't end in medical school, right? You, you know, then you become faculty, you become uh, in hospital or clinic leadership, and you see in every step along the way, the proportion of Asian and Pacific Islander physicians in those roles diminishes, right, as you keep going up. Um, and uh, I, th I think we have to be vocal about showing folks that it's not, um, you know, that uh, you know that's that's a lot of that is based on on assumptions of of what is the strong leadership skills, right? What are the characteristics of a um, physician that correlate with desirable leadership traits? And I think that goes against uh, that that is different, right? Uh, that manifests differently. Um, in, in many of our cultures. And because of that, because we don't um, ingrain cultural humility into our training, um, uh, people don't take the humble approach of trying to understand and listen and, and, uh, and, and instead um, jump to conclusions and make biases. So I know that was a long-winded answer, but the short <laughs> summary is yes, certainly we are. We do experience this. I did, and it still continues. My, many, much of it is in my form of microaggressions, and we do need to feel more comfortable about calling it out, and for those, and and helping those who are not comfortable doing, doing that, calling it out for them. Yeah, and I was I was thinking about the microaggressions today because you know, we have workshops these days, right? I think it's pretty common for medical schools to do that these days, but I think it's, it either goes one way where we have like a white list and a black list, not to be racial, <laughs> no pun intended, but you know, there's terms that things you can say, things you can't say, there's that list. It's all about just making sure you don't say things on the don't say list. But, but then I feel like there's still, uh, a stereotype that if you do bring it up, you're being overly sensitive, right? Or, or there, are there are things that may, they're very context dependent. And also the mic, the recipient of the microaggression, it's, it's purely the kind of the impact of it is so subjective. And so rather than having it be, you know, these are the terms you can't say, because I think on the other side, that kind of discourages the whomever you are, right? Um, from from learning something, you might just be afraid to say anything. And it's the it, the educational part of getting to know a culture you, you're not really aware of stops there. So I think microaggressions should be dealt in a way that that makes it open for people to talk about uncomfortable things. And I think it's so much it's much helpful when that comes from top down where you know attendings will be really open to just sit down and debrief when something big happens or debrief when you know possible things happen or offensive potentially offensive um, situations and and i think as as medical students and i've experienced this too i think it happens i tend to get more affected by things that would happen in medical school by my peers and by physicians rather than patients because to me it's like 
you're my colleagues, you're my peers, and yet you still do not see me as who I am. Because microaggression really is, you're not seeing, you're being, you're not being seen as an individual. You're being seen as a blanket of something. It could be like, for example, I'm Korean. I could be seen as North Korean. I could be seen as just Asian, you know, like the, the degree changes, but it still denies your personhood. And so like getting to that, I think should be emphasize when we, we're dealing with microaggression. And once you do that, then you can start thinking about microaggression towards other people too. Like it doesn't have you, you're able to recognize non-Asian microaggressions too, because once you understand it as, oh, you're denying somebody's personhood, you're generalizing things, then, then it's easier to call out. Um, because as I was doing research for the history and all these immigration laws, it has now moved to you know, the Latinx population, really, like that's that they're experiencing this right now. And it is on us to recognize it. it is on us to call it out and be those advocates as well, because we've definitely been there as well. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think two, two responses to, to what you said. Um, yeah, ideally, you know, attendings who are in a position of power and can more easily you know, bring these up, but the truth is most attendings and folks who are my age and above have not um, gotten any of that. They don't know any of this history, right? Mm -hmm. They don't know how to recognize or interrupt bias. Um, and so it is a huge, you know, uphill battle in terms of faculty development, but something we badly, badly need. I think, um, academic medical centers across the country are are starting to make this required but it is it, this is a lifelong journey right to undo um, undo things that have been you know really now hardwired um, so you know I, I think I, I think that that should be true but just to be realistic about that often may not happen um, I also see something in the chat as well the approach um, you know, I, I, there are there are lots of uh, uh, there are, there's lots of um, literature about about how to respond and um, you know I agree with you uh, to um, uh, to keep make sure that you are um, someone doesn't become defensive and close off right to responding uh, really emphasizing this was the impact on me right this is this is the result right of your action or your words, this was the impact. Uh, and it's not a matter of intent or not, right? You're taking, you, you don't need to make assumptions about intent, but this was the impact, right? And um, the person, you know, I do, you know, I hope, especially, um, you know, if you're talking amongst colleagues, right? It would be someone who uh, would care, right? They, they, may, they may not know what to do. Um, and they may feel badly and we have to be prepared, right? <laughs> that that might happen. Um, but emphasizing that, you know, this is how it, it this is what it, it did to me and, and this is why. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to spend some time tackling the meaty second question, which is the statement that DEI efforts, um, something that you said you've heard, um, which is that DEI efforts should be reserved only for brown, black and brown folk, Asians should step aside. And I think this is a sentiment that I'm sure every um, every single medical student in their institution has felt at, at least at one point in time. And I think it has to do with the this like this teeter tottering of like we are minority in some cases with some definitions or majority in in some definitions and so i uh, i wanted to hear hear your thoughts on how you reacted when you heard this yeah it, it's it it's so this was something that someone had said and um there's just so much behind that uh statement right and, and i think that um you know kind of breaking it down and approaching it uh, we uh, we do have to recognize that many Asians have benefited from the structural racism that is in place, and um, you know, it, and even though it does center whiteness, 
it also um, in in um, discriminating against other groups, in some cases we have benefited, right? And I think that we have to just acknowledge that that is true. Um, and um, the other thing is to think about, you know, what work, how can we make the biggest impact, right? You know, what what is your goal in in terms of um, advancing DEI efforts, and how can we make the biggest impact? And you know, if you um, in some cases, we may have make the biggest impact as someone who sponsors and supports others and having opportunities, right? Sometimes it, it, we, we may, um, you know, in the situation, you may be the most person with the most experience, right? And quali uh, qualifications, and you should advocate for yourself. In some cases, you may be a person who has some power um, uh, or some advantage of power at least and in, in and then you can do more good by sponsorship um, and I think that's something that you know particularly as you become uh, um, attending and faculty member think about uh, where your uh, role might be um, uh, the, the other thing is we all have to acknowledge our limitations as well right we you know I, I can I can never know and I have never lived the experience of being a black woman, right? That's mm -hmm. just my limitation. And um, in in acknowledging all of those, I think then when you're doing the work, you you will know that there are there are some things that you can't speak to, right? And take that opportunity to again engage and sponsor and give other people voice, right? Um, that and. It, so there, I, I think just thinking about the, there, that there are different ways um, to still be a leader in that area. I also wanted uh, to hear you talk a little bit more about the, in, in our like pre-seminar discussions, you're talking about like which DEI topics necessarily get addressed because you were talking about your colleague who is a DEI officer and she's a Korean American and she was now in a position of deciding who's out of all these different arrays of, you know, uh, topics and ethnic groups that she needs to pay attention to, like how the logistics of that happen in, in that um, leadership position. Yeah, it, it's, it's really hard, right? I, I think um, you, you need to listen to everyone's voice. And I think we, we, we know, I, I, I think, um, un uniquely as such a huge um, uh, diversity within the Asian and Pacific Islander group, right? That um, you know, one having one uh, one of something to represent everyone is really tokenism, right? Mm -hmm. That's not representation. Mm -hmm. So how how do you do that? And it, and it's really difficult. It, it's a lot about um, listening to the communities. You know, thinking about um, the community, not just not just in your bubble in your school, right, or the campus, but around you. You know the people who live in the communities that you're serving, right? And um, how do we try to um, make sure that we are uh, we're not leaving anyone behind? You know, and advocating for those who don't have uh, who don't have the voice. I, I think when we were talking about this because we've been doing a big project to disaggregate data. And I think I'll put that on your action items, right? That's one of the root causes of why we have this, you know, over-representation myth is because we don't disaggregate the data, right? All Asians and Pacific, well, in some cases, Pacific Islanders are lumped together. In some cases, they're not, right? Um, but in general, um, really, uh, we're not, people don't see they don't really see the Asian community, right? Because we're we're aggregating them together. So our project is really trying to um, uh, to uh, al allow people to identify uh, in their medical record and registration the way that they would like to be identified, right? To be able to offer groups that represent them and to offer opportunities to write in if none of those things offered. Uh, represents how they feel um, that they identify. And it's been really challenging because 
Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a quality improvement person. So from a quality and efficiency standpoint, offering 360 categories for <laughs> race and ethnicity is um, really a workflow nightmare. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I think we recognize that it's, uh, it's important to, uh, it, it's important to listen to those and then reach out to those groups who are maybe not being represented. Um, so not just the folks who are making a lot of noise, right, and advocating, although I, I to Jay's point, we should all make noise and advocate, uh, because if we don't, we'll be pushed to the back of the line. Um, but once you're in a position of, uh, of power, then thinking about, okay, now whose voice have I not heard, right? Who, who's not at the table? Who's not in this discussion? Um, and reach out, right? Don't wait to be, um, don't wait to, to hear, reach out proactively. Mm -hmm. And I, I know we have like six minutes left. So if people have questions, toss them in the chat. <laughs> but in the meantime, I'll ask another question. Um, so I know I put what as you know, making noise. Um, and like you said, you, I've heard the qualification, you know, when you have power, right. And I think that's a big, big thing because for, it's hard to imagine like when that happens, like, do you just suddenly, you know, after residency, like you feel the power. <laughs> I feel like it doesn't because it's always <laughs> like, you're always, you know, trying to get to the next level. <laughs> yeah, you know? And so I, I wonder if there's like a, I'm sure there are ways that you can continue to advocate like even along the way. And so that's why I put the research down there because I feel like, you know, medical students are often involved and, and residents will often be involved in, in thinking of research questions. And it, it like the least you can do is like be the person who's like, ah, uh, should we like include Asians or like not toss out the group because we're too small, you know, like case numbers are too small or things like that. But I was wondering if you had like other ideas of how to how to do like advocacy work throughout rather than like waiting till you have the power to do it. Yeah, that's a great question, but I would just tell you you all have power. You are a college educated, you are in medical school. I know you have a buttload of debt. You know, I also accumulated $250,000 of debt of which I am still about 70% through. <laughs> but you have you have power, right? You, uh, as a tuition paying student, um, you know, you wouldn't believe how much, how much power you have as a tuition paying student, right? More than if you were an employee, honestly. Um, so I think taking advantage of, of that, don't think of yourself as, as powerless, um, but think about the opportunities that you do have. You know, I think that uh, APAMSA chapters all across the country have done amazing work um, around Asian hate, around bone marrow drives. I mean, nationally garnered attention and really brought a lot of these issues to the forefront. Um, and so I think don't don't estimate that. And and another thing I would say is is um, is partnership, right? Partnering and collaborating um, with other uh, with other organizations with other um, medical student organizations um, and with community organizations. Um, I, I think um, I, you also don't underestimate like how much community-based organizations value having uh, physicians and medical students uh, participate and be part of their um, leadership uh, team. So I think that those are, you know, some ways to start um, getting used to that. Some of it is getting used to having some power, right? Acknowledging it and getting used to that and knowing that, you know, you have the opportunity to do something. That's awesome. Yeah, I agree. I, I think we, we tend to get in the mindset of like, oh no, we, we have to, the next step, we're always just like looking, peering to the next step, but you're totally right in that we are just by being in this position, we're truly privileged. And we, whether it was through like luck of our ancestors and the ways that they came to the US, you know, there's just predetermined things that allowed us to be here. And um, 
we should definitely use that for the good of the underprivileged. Yeah. Well, yeah, as yeah. Uh, that's the end of the hour. Um, so I'm gonna let people enjoy the rest of the evenings. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Wu, uh, for volunteering your time. I know I kind of cold email you do, but you still said yes and you uh, um, uh, helped me kind of think about this and put this together. So thank you so much. Yeah, you did a really great job. And come come do rotations at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. <laughs> For sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Wu. As people are dropping off, um, I just want to remind everyone that our um, strategy-based discussion about how to advocate effectively within our institutions um, is going to be uh, Friday night um, before conference. Um, it will be virtual now. That is a change. Um, I know Jay sent out that announcement. Um, please check Jay's email uh, for, the, for the Zoom link. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Hi, Thank you. Stay safe.